Let's get into Psalm 19. I titled this evening's message and teaching to be uh, God's beauty, strength, and deliverance. Let's see. Uh, yes, the guy's got the spelling right. I, I, I spelled deliverance wrong, and I was like, oh, no, boy, guys, I spelled deliverance wrong. So, amen. We got the deliverance squared away. Um, Psalm 19, you're going to see three different psalms here this evening. Psalm 19 speaks of God's uh, uh, revelation, the revelation that God shows us through his creation. Uh, the first six verses of chapter 19, David is declaring the wonderful things of God. He's declaring the things that he can see, uh, the heavens, the firmament, the, the things around him. And so that's what Psalm 19 is about. And, you know, I can't help but think that it might have been his times as a shepherd, you know, out there with his sheep under God's cathedral, you know, seeing the stars at night and the, and the moon and the different planets and such. And then in the daytime, just seeing the beauty of the clouds and the sun and, and different things as well, just the creation around him. Um, David looks to the heavens. He looks to God's word in this as well. He looks to his own sin as well and to salvation. And it's interesting, as I found this tidbit of information, that this particular psalm in some Jewish cultures is sang on Shabbat. And it's that Sabbath night, that Saturday, to where they would sing it. Because when they're entering into a time, I forget the time they enter into, but they're, if they're coming to this particular season, they, 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 they sing this that first evening of Shabbat, and, and it is for the giving thanks to God before they bring petitions to him. Because Psalm 20 and 21 is David seeking God for safety and for deliverance from his enemies and the nation. And then Psalm 21 is, they're in tandem with each other, it is the thankfulness to God for saving them. So that's the things we have in store this evening. So I'm going to read them in kind of in chunks. They're not a lot of verses, but uh, we'll read them in a little bit of chunks. Uh, psalm 19, verse 1 says this. To the chief musician, the psalm of David, the heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament shows his handiwork. Day unto day utters speech, and night unto night reveals knowledge. There is no speech nor language where their voice is not heard. That line has gone out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. In them, he has set a tabernacle for, uh, for the sun, which is like a bridegroom coming out of his chamber and rejoices like a strong man to run its race. Its rising is from one end of heaven and its circuit to the other end, and there is nothing hidden from its heat. So God here is showing of himself revealing of himself. David knows this, he sees this, and it's all the revelation by nature. And so we know that there's two types of revelation in the Bible. We have general revelation, and we have specific revelation. And what David is speaking about is general revelation, that of which is general around us. We can see the trees, we can see the, the rivers, we can see the clouds, we can see the sun, we can see all the beautiful things that God has created. And how could we not, except for being blind, since spiritually is what I'm talking about, spiritually blind, to not know that there's been a design. To not know that there's a creator behind all of these marvelous things. And so David looks to the heavens to witness, because it's the heavens and all of these things that he sees that is a witness or a, that testifies God of himself. And David takes note of that. And the evidence is that David sees as God's workmanship and his care to it. I mean, we might take it for granted here in Virginia, I think. Um, in fact, I, I do, until I go to California and see desert, and then I come back here and I see trees, right? You can always tell when you're flying, right? You can always tell when you're kind of crossing over uh, the mid part of the country into that lush part of our south to where you see the green on. Huh? Isn't it beautiful? And sometimes I can take, I can just take that for granted because we're around so much of it. Here in Williamsburg, we're around all this water, are we not? Wonderful lakes, wonderful rivers and streams. There's a pond behind where I live and a stream behind where I live as well. But, but I like never to look at it, you know, because I'm always in my house or in the front of my house or, or here or somewhere else. 
So I kind of take it, take it for granted. And so David here is not taking it for granted. David is actually, in a sense, stopping, as we would say, stopping and smelling the roses. He's like seeing God's handiwork, and he's seeing his wonder, he's seeing his majesty, but he also sees the care that God puts into it. I don't know if you've ever picked up a leaf. Uh, you pick up a leaf and you kind of hold it in the sun, and you see it's like little veins, right? I don't know what they call them, but they're like little veins. And, and that's that's what gives life to that leaf, right? You see the intricacies of things. You pick up a you pick up a dead cicada. You know those you know what cicadas are, right? Those, those little those big looking bugs like that, right? They come out in the springtime. And you hear them with the rubbing their wings, right? We hear them have them all over Virginia. And so um, you pick up a dead one. Uh, that's kind of recently dead. And if you hold it by its wings, you can just see the intricacies and the care that God took in, in making that creature, right? In making that insect. Uh, you think about bees and the wonderful thing that they can produce honey that you and I enjoy and that we eat. God takes a lot of care into what he does and to what he makes. And also, it's not just the insects or nature, but it's also you and me. He's taken a lot of care and preciseness and gentleness in how he's made us, his creation, his ultimate creation, I believe, um, above all other things. And so that's evidence. That's evidence that David sees. It's the evidence also of God's power, his ability to do this and to do this stuff right. It also shows his love and also it shows that God is around. God exists, right? That there is a God. It's not just by happenstance. It's not just by a big bang. It's not by just some, some thing that happened that all of a sudden now all of this stuff exists. But truly that God himself exists. It's not by chance, in other words. Think about the design, the placement of the stars and the solar systems. In the daytime, you see the clouds. And if you do fly in a plane, you can see when the plane reaches above the clouds and goes through the clouds, which is just kind of one level, then, you, you know, there's just so much more above us. There's just so much more that we have yet even to, to that we can see with the naked eye. We can't see it. We have to get into a spaceship, right? And we've got to, like, go up and out to get into the, to that stratosphere. It's, it's just amazing to me. And then David says that these things speak. Now, we know for a fact that the tree doesn't speak audibly to us. The, the heavens don't declare in a sense of speaking to us. But what we do know, in, metaphorically, is that they do tell, they testify of God. I think that's the most important thing. They testify of their creator, creator God. You and I, every single day, we testify of our creator God, do we not? We testify, and we can say, we can do it audibly. We can share with people what he's done to change our lives. We can testify to people on how we lived a life one way, and now he's come into our life, and we're living it totally different and much better, and with, with just so much more joy. We can actually speak. The clouds can't speak. A tree can't tell me anything. A frog doesn't speak to me. But I can hear from John or EJ or Spence. I can hear from you guys or anybody here. And I can hear about how God has changed your life. And you can testify. That's such a greater thing, I think, than, than even the general revelation. We can be used to speak and declare the amazing things that our Creator has done in us and through us. But he says that they speak, meaning creation, and there is no place where they are heard, meaning it is just loud. All right? It is loud because it's all around us. I don't care wherever we go in the world, whether it's here or Japan or England or India, wherever it is, there's clouds and there's trees and all of these things speak very loudly. What do they speak of? They speak of that there is a creator God. That's what they speak of. And he says they speak from one end to the other, right? That's what I just said. They speak from one end of the earth to the other end of the earth. And they all declare the same thing. Pretty amazing. This is what I would think of. I want you to walk away with one thing from this particular portions of passage is God's glory. Because we see God's glory every single day. 
And I pray as myself that we don't always take it for granted. But we do take a moment to stop and smell the roses, per se. We do take a moment to at least see the leaves of change. I mean, so many people come to our neck of the woods because of the changing of, of, of uh, leaves, right? The changing of the seasons from summer to fall and fall into winter. They come here specifically for that. Yet we who live here, sometimes we just kind of take it for granted, yeah? And we're like, oh yeah, well maybe next year I'll go to the Shenandoah Valley, or maybe next year I'll go to the Blue Ridge Mountains, or maybe next year I'll go to Northern Virginia where all those great looking trees are, and all the valleys and all the mountains. We just kind of sometimes do that. But think about God's glory. What it is, I think it's a constant revelation that glorifies Him. That's the idea behind His creation. Everything God does, know this, is to glorify Him. You and I, in by his creation, are made to glorify him, not ourselves. The creation that speaks out, that, that cries out, that speaks for itself, is to glorify God, who is the creator. That's what it's for, and it's constant, it's everywhere. Isaiah 45, 6 says this, that they may know, they, meaning the people, from the rising of the sun to the setting, that there is none besides me, says God. Think about that. There is none besides me. I'm like in a league of my own. He says, I am the Lord, and there is no other. I form the light, he says, and create darkness. I make peace, and I create calamity. I, the Lord, do all of these things. Is there nothing too impossible for God to do? Is there absolutely nothing too difficult for him to, to, to handle, to make, to create? Absolutely not. See, that's the encouragement we have because of our Creator God. That He is a, a He has the ability and He has the desire to do amazing and marvelous things. If we can see the amazing things He does in creation, just think what He can do with you in your own life. Me and my own life. Just think about it. I mean, just think about the things. That, that you have been able to do in the name of the Lord. Because now that you have him in you, he's able to, he's given you faith to walk through difficult trials. He's given you faith to, to handle and to endure things in life. He's given you the, the, the spirit which utters the things of God to other people and encourages them. He gives us the ability to discern scripture only given by his Holy Spirit. Those are great and marvelous things that we then can be, instead of a tree, we can be the ones who are witness and testify to the world that God is great and God is able. In verses 7 through 11, then, we see something a little bit different, another area that David realizes, and I think we can realize for our own life. He says in 7 through 11, the law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. The testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise the simple. The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of the Lord is clean, enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold. Yea, they much fine gold than much fine gold. Sweeter also than honey and the honeycomb. Moreover, by them your servant is warned, and in keeping them there is great reward. So David now switches from creation to God's word. He speaks specifically about God's word, that God is revealed not only by nature, by his creation, but he's also revealed through and by his word, his holy word. It's just another type or another way that he communicates to this fallen world that who he is. David now looks to God's word, and it's a blessing for his life, he says. Now, I don't want us to get tripped up, okay? As we go through Galatians on Sundays, and we talk about the law, and we talk about grace, okay? I want you guys not to get tripped up. I don't want you guys thinking that the law is bad, okay? That the law is wrong, because that's not the case, okay? One of the things is that, you know, in that, when they talk about God's law, Specifically, that's what it means, is God's law. We're not to be get it confused with the law of Moses, in a sense. God's law was the Ten Commandments. 
That was his law. In fact, it says that, that it was given God's law, not Moses' law. Now, the law then began, as I've read, and as I can foretell in what I've read and studied, is that the law actually began its genesis when, during the Babylonian captivity, that all of these different things, now there's Deuteronomy, of course, and there's Numbers, that's all part of the Mosaic law, the law of Moses. But a lot of the pharisaical laws didn't happen until later on. But here David speaks of the law being God's word. Let's not confuse that. God's law in the context of its life-giving blessing. It's amazing to think about that because we're all, we're, we're kind of like, wait, wait a minute, wait a minute. I thought the law was, 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 was not a life-giving blessing. Or maybe we think it's not by the different teachings, but I don't want us to understand in the context of, of what I teach or what we share. Okay, we're not saying that the law is bad or wrong or not good. But remember, in the context of law versus grace, the law is such that points us to the grace of God, that points us to salvation. That's what the law does. But the law in and of itself is a good thing. David says that, in fact, the law refreshes him, and it brings him direction, and it brings him comfort to those who know the law and to those who live it. I mean, Jesus gave us three commandments, if you will. Let's call them three laws. To love thy Lord thy God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and to love others above ourselves, and we would love others. Those are two commandments from God. Two laws, if you will, from God, from Jesus himself. And so many times we fall short of loving others as Christ loves us. So many times we fall short of putting God in priority and loving God above all things of our mind, body, and soul. And we put other things before the Lord. We do. We do. And in that, so, so we see even that in, in the New Testament of sorts. But there's a different emphasis in the New Testament versus the Old Testament. The New Testament emphasizes relationship, which is so important to understand. It, it emphasizes relationship. To see God's creation is one thing. We're like, whoa, look at that waterfall. Gene and I went to Niagara Falls in early October of last year. And to see that was an amazing thing to see. God's creation forming those two waterfalls, the American Falls and the Canadian Falls, and, and seeing those and saying, man, Lord, the power, the, 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 the way that you've done this, carved it out, it's so amazing, so beautiful. You're not like in awe of it. You just cannot stop looking at it. There's so much water. But there's quite another thing to hear and to read the Word of God because that's what brings salvation. It's not a waterfall that I look at and say, oh man, wow, there was a creator. Yes, I can agree. Okay, let me call him God. But that doesn't save me. It's when I read or I hear the word of God and then the spirit of God pricks my heart and moves me then to a decision. And in that, that's when people get saved. Romans 10, 7 says, faith comes by hearing, and hearing by what? The word of God, okay? In verse 7, we see some words that are used there. The law of the Lord is perfect, converting the soul, law meaning the word, perfect meaning whole, meaning no creation. Converting means rescues, I like that. The law of the Lord is perfect, rescuing the soul. Hearing or reading the word of God and hearing the word of God. It also means restores and it also means retrieve. He's like snatching us out, right? He's snatching us out of the world, retrieving us from the world and to his family. And the testimony he speaks of is God's witness. And that testimony, he says, is sure, which means it's steadfast. It's unwavering. It doesn't, it doesn't waver. It's not shifting at all. 
He also talks about it being trustworthy. And it's interesting here in verse 7, some commentators believe there's a connection, which I can see, uh, with the, uh, it says, the testimony of the Lord is sure, making wise and simple. And in that, we can even see that it's a the trustworthiness of actually the Son. Commentators say that, well, you know what? The Son being that of which exposes things, right? When the Son or the lights are on, uh, things are exposed. And so here, the law of the Lord being whole and rescuing or restoring the soul, the witness of the Lord is, is, is steadfast, making wise the simple. And so that way, the, God's word is revealing to us. It shows us things, just like the sun shows us things in the daytime. Verse 8, it says, The statutes of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandments of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. You see, there's always a, a, a purpose behind these things. I want you to look at that. It says, The statutes of the Lord are right. They rejoice, they're rejoicing the heart. The commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. There's a purpose. There's a purpose for all of these things. Statutes is also principles or precepts. When he says it's right, it means it's straight. It's not crooked. It's not all willy-nilly. It's, 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 it's straight. It's a straight road. Pure means clean or clear. There's no confusion. There's no confusion. It's clear. And then also, says it's enlightened, which we know that would mean to show us something, something that is enlightened, something that is shown. In verse 9, he then says, the fear of the Lord is clean and enduring forever. The judgments of the Lord are true and righteous altogether. Fear meaning reverence and clean meaning, in this context here, clean meaning fair. The fear of the Lord is, is, is fair, it's, it's, it's just, it's, the enduring of it is standing firm. The judgments or the order of it is true, meaning it's established. It's firm. It's established. The word here that I see in these scriptures is, um, is a word that came to me, if I can remember this, but revise. I would say revival, but revise. See, the word of the Lord revives us. How many times have you guys, myself included, how many times have we been in a situation or been down in the dumps and what happens is we, we recall a portion of scripture. I was talking to a lady a couple nights ago who was pretty down in the dumps. And yet we asked her if she knew or had a favorite scripture that we could read to her. What was really encouraging is that this woman quoted it all verbatim. I'm not talking about, you know, just one line. It was amazing to both of us that, wow, you know what, in a time that we are struggling in, in a time that we feel lost or we feel far from the Lord or we feel we're just in a, in a, in a situation, we can call upon the Lord by his word. We can be encouraged by his word. And that revives us. That restores us, does it not? I mean, how many times think about it when you've gone to that favorite part of Scripture that is your life verse? Anybody here? Raise your hand. Does anybody here have a life verse? Life verses? Yeah. I mean, and you go to that verse, right? I mean, you go to that verse, and it's like, man, that kind of just recharges your battery. That just kind of says, you know, Lord, you're not a liar, for one thing, and your word is true. And I'm going to continue walking forward in whatever is before me. That's the neat thing about God's word. David says that it refreshes us. He says that it, the law revives us. It makes us wise. It gives joy to our hearts. It light to our eyes. It gives us warning. And David then ends and says it even rewards us. How does it reward us? Because we've been able to follow the ways of the Lord. And following the ways of the Lord is not going to be detrimental to our health. Or detrimental to our life, is it? I don't think so. When's the last time God steered you wrong? When's the last time He led you to a path of destruction? When's the last time He took you to a place that was just a flat dead end? 
I would have to say never. That's not our Lord. There's a reward for each and every one of us that follows the Lord and follows his way. God's laws are God's ways to light our path, in other words. You need light to your dark path. You need light in that area. Think of the sun, how it illuminates. You need light, well, it's God's word. It's a light unto my path, a lamp unto my feet. It brings you through the way. It really does. God's law is not something that chains us or should chain us or bind us, but it helps us avoid pitfalls in life, things that will harm us, while also it's simultaneously pointing to us the way to help us. That's what the Bible is all about. That's what his word is all about. We're told in the New Testament, Romans 7, 7, that the law isn't a fault in a sense. He says, is the law sin? Paul says, no. The law is not sin. Of course not. See, it's interesting, the law isn't at fault in anything, but it's our sin that's at fault. As I said, the Ten Commandments, when it says it, it, it was spoken of, of the law of God, not the law of Moses. The law of Moses, like I said, were civil laws and ritualistic laws in Leviticus chapters 1 through 7, Exodus 21 through 23. Hebrews 9.10 and even Galatians 2.16 speaks of those types of laws, the laws of Moses, but not the law of God, not his laws. 12 through 14, as we close this chapter, says, Who can understand his errors? Cleanse me from my secret, cleanse me from secret faults. Keep back your servant also from presumptuous sins. Let them not have dominion over me, then I shall be blameless, and I shall be innocent of great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. Lord, my strength and my redeemer. We sing that song, don't we? The words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable to you, O God. We, we, we sing that song. It's a worship song. And that's what David's desire is. At the end of the day, he says, Lord, you know what? You you reveal my sin to me. That's his response. His response is such, I think, one of, again, we see David, his openness, his vulnerability, and we see his lack of fear to bear it all before God and before every one of us. He has a, a, a response of humility and wanting. David is humble in saying, I'm a sinner, but a wanting in saying, I want my words to be God glorifying. I want my actions to be to be God glorifying. You see, David, David wants that in his life. You and I should desire the same thing. The same very thing. David says, listen, I am not perfect. How many of you here tonight would say, I'm perfect? All right, praise the Lord. We pass the test. None of us are perfect, right? None of us are perfect. David here can say with humility and desire, say, Lord, I'm not perfect. Now, you see, that's really the purpose of the law, I believe. Purpose of the law is to show us, yes, I am not perfect. I cannot attain to these things. I need a Savior. I need something greater than myself to help me, to pull me out of this miry clay, to, to, to make a change in my life. And that, and that person is Jesus Christ. And only Jesus who can make that happen. When we're in need of forgiveness, that doesn't come from the law. The law is unforgiving. The forgiveness comes from Jesus Christ and Him alone. Again, because the law points out to every one of us that we are guilty. And that we need Jesus. Whether sinning intentionally or unintentionally, like David says, David still says, I desire to be blameless and innocent before you, God. Now, how are we blameless and innocent before God? It's the righteousness of Jesus Christ. 
that has been imputed to every one of us, given to you and I. His righteousness cleans us. His righteousness makes us clean before God, makes us holy before a holy God. It's the righteousness of Jesus Christ. And when you and I gave our lives to Christ, he gave us that righteousness right then, right there. And we gave him our sin. Is that amazing? That's the only way, the only way, my friends, that we can be blameless and innocent before a very holy God. And that is if we give our lives to Christ, trading for him our sin for his righteousness. And now we, we have a garment or a cloak of righteousness. And the only way, like I said on Sunday, the only way is Jesus. Jesus is the way, the way, the way, the truth, and the life. It is only Jesus Christ. You can't get it through Muhammad. You can't get it through Buddha. You can't get it through any Shintoism religion. You can't get it through any whatever else. You can't get it through that stuff. You can only get it through Jesus Christ. He is the way. Oh, but Tom, that is just so, man, intolerant. That is just so dogmatic. That is just so unyielding. Okay, call it what you want. I really don't care. But I know what I believe. And what I believe is that Jesus is the only way. That's it, God. It's just Jesus and him alone. And praise God you guys feel the same way. How do we get to Jesus? We go to the throne of grace. Hebrews tells us we can go there boldly before the throne of grace. Never be afraid of going to your Savior. David is not afraid. Or, 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 or hesitant to go to the Savior, to go to God and say, God, I need help. We're going to find that in the next two chapters as well. David then ends with a prayer that all he says and he thinks would be acceptable, like you said. I think it's interesting as I thought. It's like, well, you know what? I can believe, I think at times I can curb what I say. I can hold back. Right? I think all of us can hold back. So, Lord, help me be mindful not to say anything stupid. All right? I say that every Sunday and Wednesday. It's like, let, let me say something that's clear, that's, that's edifying, not something dumb, right? But what about our thought line? What about our thought line? It's very difficult to hold back our thought line. I'm the first one to say that. Very difficult. You're talking to someone, they're talking about something. Maybe for the umpteenth time, and our response in our mind could be very different than what we actually say to them. We could say, Come on, this is like the fifth time, man. And yet you're here again, crying in your soup and your in your taco, you're crying in front of me that you've transgressed, you've sinned, and it's like that's what you were thinking, but you're like going, Oh bro, man, I know what you mean. I'm just oh, I gotta pray for you. I remember God's grace, bro. I mean, our mind, it's hard to shut it off, is it? It's hard to shut it off. So we might accomplish what we say, but about what we think. James 1.26 says, if anyone among you thinks he's religious, do not, does not bridle his own tongue, but deceives his own heart, this one's religion is useless. And I'm thinking about Bridling our mind. Can we bridle our mind? Can we take those thoughts captive as someone brings us something or we see something, yet we're quick to judgment? Then David says, Oh Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Strength means rock. The way it's used here in the Hebrew, he's saying, it's, Lord, my rock. My solid rock, the one that I can get myself to and climb upon because it's not going to move. The, the rock that is big enough that brings safety to me and keeps me high above all the different things that are after me. It's solid. It's unwavering. It's unshakable. The rock of Christ. It's interesting. I think here that David looks at 
The way he says it, let my words and my mouth and my meditation of my heart be acceptable. It's almost like an offering. Let this offering of the things of my heart and my mouth and my mind, let them, Lord, be acceptable to you as an offering unto you. As an offering that would be pleasing to you, God. I think he means it that way. And his desire is that every single word or thought or meditation on his heart, that they would be a sweet offering. One that is just so good. And one that the Lord says, yeah, I can smell the aroma of your sacrifice. It's amazing to me. Keep it coming. Well, let's look then at verse or chapter 20, Psalms 20 and 21. It's interesting. These two Psalms, they go hand in hand, actually. The, the Psalm 20 is one of David saying, Lord, we need some help. Psalm 21 is saying, Lord, thank you for the help. That's really what's happening. Really simple. But he says a lot of neat things in between those two bookends. What we see here is it was written in the sense, along with that other psalm, as I said, and David is praying for God's favor in a time to where they really, really needed it. It's taken from 2 Samuel chapter 10. You don't have to turn there, but you can refer to that later. And it's at a time, a really interesting time. The king of the Amorites was very kind to King David. And when the king of the Amorites died, his son, I forget his name, starts with a pen, I want to say Nam or or something like that. Anyway, the sun is reigning over. Okay? And what happens is, is that David, man, just wants to send him some condolences. And just wants to go, man, your dad was kind to me. I'm so sorry for your loss. Let me just show you, illustrate for you, out of that chapter, how things can get so convoluted and mixed up when you listen to that counsel. He sends some servants over to this king. They arrive, and yet his counselors say, wait a minute, you got, this is King David's man. Uh, you know he's just coming here to scope things out. You know he's coming here to kind of look at things. He's not here for any real reason other than that. Well, this young king listens to the very bad counsel. Just as a side note, the people who counsel you in your life, be careful. Be careful, because it makes things bad for everybody. Us included, we make a decision based off that counsel. We kind of have mud on our face or egg in our face, don't we? Then we've got to ask the Lord for forgiveness because we, 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 we saw the situation wrongly and we, we jumped when we shouldn't have. So what happens is these, however many servants say, <laughs> what this guy does is he, he cuts off their tunics from the waist down. All right? I don't need to be any more descriptive than that. And he sends them back to Jerusalem in their humiliation and shame. On the way there, someone comes to them and sees them, goes back to David. David, which I think is amazing, instead of having them come into the city, he, he goes to meet them. I think that was really kind of King David, actually. Because otherwise, not everyone in Jerusalem would see them in this condition. These guys are already ashamed and shamed by what was going on. He said, okay, you guys, hey, hey take, you, go live over here. We're going to get you some clothes. Go live over here until your hair grows out because they cut their beards and everything, which was also humiliating. Go live over here until your beards grow out. We got you some clothes. Hang tight. Come on back when you guys are settled. And then this young king is so flipped out still, he hires mercenaries. He hires the Syrian armies total of 23,000 Syrians to come and attack Jerusalem because he's still receiving bad counsel and he's flipping out. Well, who do you think wins? The Israelites. I mean, David and his, and his mighty army, army, they win. They're victorious. That's what David is praying for in Psalm 20. He's asking for favor from God. Have you guys ever done something that hasn't been your fault, yet you're blamed for it? Uh, yeah, huh? A lot of us have gone through a situation where we've been unrighteously judged, or we've been taken advantage of, or 
We've been slandered or spoken evil of, talking behind someone's back about someone else. It's wrong. It's just plain wrong. You want to put a label so on Christian, right? In our ears, love the tickling. And we love to kind of jump into it. Be careful again on the, those who counsel you, those who you go to counsel. It's not from the Word of God. And unbiased in the sense of letting the Word be the guide. Be careful of that individual or this group of people. So what we see here is these David wins. Not because of David. He's going to give the Lord. So here he goes. Here he goes. He's, he, he already rests in verses 1 through 5 of Psalm 20 of the salvation of the Lord. He says, The chief musician, Psalm of David, may the Lord answer you in the day of trouble. May the name of God of Jacob defend you. May he send you help from the sanctuary and strengthen you out of Zion. May he remember all of your offerings and accept your burnt sacrifices. Verse 4. May he grant you according to the heart of your heart's desire and fulfill your purpose. We will rejoice in your salvation, and in the name of our Lord, we will set up banners. Notice, notice. Oh, then he says, may the Lord fulfill all your petitions. Notice here, uh, everything he's speaking is, 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 hasn't happened yet. He's already giving thanks to God. He's already saying, in the day of trouble, Lord, may he answer you. Another interesting thing is he says the God of Jacob. He doesn't say Israel. I thought, why doesn't he say Israel? So I did a little bit more research. Apparently at this time, the children of Israel were not in a very good spiritual state. And in the Old Testament, when things are referenced to Jacob, it's referenced to when they're just kind of, the children are just like, like, like not, not walking rightly spiritually. And so Jacob, heel catcher, versus Israel, which means governed by God. Big difference, right? Big difference. When we're governed by God, we're walking in His ways and thinking the things as He desires us to think. We're, we're walking in the Spirit, are we not? But when we're in the ways of Jacob, we're not being governed by God. We're being governed by our own ways and our own thoughts and our own actions. So here's an indication that the children of Israel, that those in Israel were not walking rightly. And in, and in this, we see that the nation, and it's struggling spiritually, the battle is still going to go on. Look, look at this. Know this. Even though you're spiritually struggling or I'm spiritually struggling in some way, guess what? The battle still goes on. Whether you're ready or not. Whether you've got the full armor of God on or not, the battle is going to rage on with you. It's going to rage on with you and with me. The enemy doesn't care if you're girding. The enemy doesn't care if you're if you're fully loaded with the armor or not, the enemy's going to take advantage of our weaknesses and our and our and, and, and those openings, those breaches in our armor, and the breaches in our walls and defenses. He goes to the throne of God. And the neat thing about it, as we said in Hebrews, that you can go to the throne of grace. And you can do it boldly, without reproach. God isn't going to say, man, Tom, you're here for the fifth time today. Come on, what's your problem? He's not going to say that to me. He's going to say, I'm glad you're here. What can, I, what can I do for you, Tom? I want you to come to me, he says. You see, the throne of God isn't far from his children. Is it? The throne of God is just, and we studied last week that, that David spoke of God's hearing him, even to the ear next to the throne. Just think about it. God in his throne hears you, and he hears me. And so when we cry out to him, when you're having a tough day, when you're weak, when you're just done, you're fed up, you want to throw the towel in, guess what? You cry out to the Lord. Hears you. I think that's amazing. All the way, we would think, from the throne of heaven, wherever it is, we can't even see it. God hears us. And he answers your prayers. And he answers my petitions. He sends help. And he does it in strength. 
even like the children of Israel, even like those in Israel at that time, are not fully engaged or walking with the Lord in whatever way. They're not spiritually right. How many times do you and I not go to Jesus because, because, because we think we're not spiritually right? Because we think that we're just not together in our spirituality. And we don't go to the Lord. We try to fix it ourselves. This is great evidence, I think, for us to know that even when we're not fully walking rightly with God, we still are his children and we can go to him. Let me encourage you guys to do that. Don't be all prideful about it. Don't be all guilted out about it. Whatever is going on in your life, we need to go to the Lord. No matter where we're at with the Lord, whatever life we've fallen into believing about the enemy into our lives, when he's saying us and getting us and hitting us, we still go to Jesus. Man, he, he goes to them. He needs their protection. He needs their help. He needs their new Lord support. And when times are upon us and troubles are upon us, hey, even when we're struggling, we go to the Lord. Even when we're not fully engaged with God, guess what? God is fully engaged with you. Amen? Isn't it? He's tracking. You may not be tracking, but he's tracking. He knows what's going on in your life. Even though you haven't come to church, or you haven't picked up the word, or you haven't been in Bible study, you haven't been in devotion, you've been kind of a rotten husband lately, or a rotten wife, or you've been kids, you've been like rotten kids, whatever it is, hey, guess what? God still hears you. God still hears you. Even in those times. Pretty amazing. He's always engaged with us, even though we're not engaging with him. Verse 3, then we see that when we go into battle, our prayer is that the Lord remembers our offerings with him. Lord, we, will you remember those things? Will you remember? It brings us back to a point where, like David was saying, with the meditation of my heart, it be uh, pleasing to you and be accepting to you, God, acceptable? Those offerings to him. Verses 4 and 5, we read that David is definitely not going to forget. When God delivers, David will not forget. He will give all glory according to the Lord's will. <clears throat> Notice he says there, in verse 5 it is, he says, we will rejoice. So he and the, the whole nation is going to rejoice. Not just David, but the whole nation. Verses 6 through 8 we see now, I know, says David, that the Lord lives, uh, Lord saves his anointed. He will answer him from his holy heaven with the saving strength of his right hand. Some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we will remember the name of the Lord our God. They have bowed down and fallen, but we have risen and stand upright. Save, Lord, may the king answer us when we call. Trusting in the Lord. David puts all of his trust, his faith in the Lord. No question about it. In verse 6, he starts off by saying, Now I know the Lord saves. Is that not confident? Is that not like, yes, I know the Lord saves? He's not questioning. He's not second-guessing. The word saves means victorious. It's kind of like past tense. He's victorious. He's already victorious. We as Christians come from a place of victory, not from a place of defeat. And this is the same confidence we have in our Savior, Jesus Christ. John 12, 47 says, And if anyone hears my words and does not believe, I do not judge him, for I did not come to judge the world, but to what? But to save the world. It's God's heart. God is tracking with his creation, with all of humanity. That's the good news, truly. That's the, the mission is God and his salvation. That's the mission of Jesus Christ. Matthew 18, 11 says, For the Son of Man has come to save that which was lost. Matthew 18, 11. Verses 7 to 9, then we read, uh, who or what to trust in? Well, what do we trust in this evening? What do you guys trust in, rhetorically? What do you trust in? 
It says here that as kings would, they would trust in chariots and some trust in horses. They would trust in the might of their military. That was the thing that kept them uh, safe. It was easy for kings to trust in their troops. Our military, our nation trusts in our troops, right? Our United States military, Army, Air Force, Marines, Coast Guard, all of these guys. Did I name them all? People. Uh, Army, Air Force, Navy. 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 Didn't I say Navy? No. Forgive me. Come on. I was trying to get them, that whole thing. Army, Navy, Air Force, Navy. Navy. Solid receptor. All of those guys. Dallas. Man, how can I get the Navy? That was amazing. You know, it's always easy, I thought, as kings do, to trust in things that we can see, right? You can see the horses, you can see the chariots, you can trust in those things. What are we trusting in? What are the things that you see, that I see, that I'm putting my trust in? It's hard many times to see the Lord. I don't think who's sitting right where Darren's sitting. It's like, there's God right there. Okay, I believe, you know? But he's not, in a sense, physically sitting there. Hard many times for us to believe. Uh, I look at this as David gives us a lot of contrast in here. Life contrast, to be exact. Do we trust in the world versus do we trust in the name of the Lord? Do we bow down and fall to the world versus rise and stand firm in the Lord? Two simple concepts to try to incorporate in our lives. What, what choice do we make? What choice do you make? Today, we would call it worldly things, right? Things of the world. Those types of things. Isaiah says this in 31.1, Woe to those who go to Egypt for help. Rely on horses who trust in chariots because they are many, and in horsemen because they are very strong, but who do not look to the Holy One of Israel, nor seek the Lord. It says, Woe to you. But we will all remember the name of the Lord, says David, every one of us. As for David, he had, they had no one else. He had no one else except the Lord. Notice how the king is the one who's interceding. Isn't that great? Verse 9, we see there's confidence already before the victory. Save, Lord. May the king answer us when we call. He already has confidence. He's already, he's already in a sense, saying, you know what? I'm, I'm counting on you, God. I'm counting on you. There's anticipation. What we would call this hope. When you're in a situation, dire situation, like our brother Mike Callahan, what does he hold on to? The doctors? Nope. The surgeries and procedures? Nope. As far as I know, speaking with him and hearing of him, he's relying upon the hope of Christ to see him through. The anticipation of a completed work. It sometimes doesn't turn out the way that we desire, but it will turn out the way that God wants. That's the ultimate thing. The hope of Christ, the hope that we have, that's what we trust in. We are to look to the Holy One of Israel for all of our needs. He says that, may the King answer us when we call. He knows also that in the future, I think, is they're calling the Lord again. Do you know that? There's going to be another time when you're going to need the Lord. You're going to call upon Him. You're going to ask Him for help. You're going to ask Him for assistance. You're going to, you're going to call upon His name. Lord, help me. Help me get through this final test for your students. Help me, help me get through this job. Help me make it through a promotion. Help me make it through the situations in my marriage. Help me, Lord. We're all going to go to Him. David knows that. Psalm 50, 15 says, Call upon me in the day of trouble. God encourages him. He says, I will deliver you, and you shall glorify me. Isn't that cool? He says, Go ahead, call on me. Please, call on me. He says, I'll deliver you, and you'll glorify me. Psalm 21, we see the answer and the, 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 the favor that had been given to the nation of Israel. He says to the chief musician, the Psalm of David, the king shall have joy in your strength, O Lord, and in your salvation, how greatly shall he rejoice. 
You have given him his heart's desire and will not withhold the request of his lips, say not. For you met him with the blessings of goodness. You set a crown of pure gold upon his head and asked life from you, and you gave it to him. Length of his days forever and ever. His glory is great in your salvation. Honor and majesty you have placed upon him. For you have made him most blessed forever, and you have made him exceedingly glad with your presence. For the king's, uh, for the king trusts in the Lord, and through that mercy of the Most High, he shall be moved, shall not be moved. Your hand will find all of your enemies. Your right hand will find those who hate you. You shall make them as a fiery oven in the time of your anger. The Lord shall swallow them up in his wrath, and the fire shall devour them. Their offspring you shall destroy from the earth, and the descendants from among the sons of men. For they intended evil against you. They devised a plot which they are not able to perform. Therefore, therefore, you will make them turn their back. You will make ready your arrows on their string toward their faces. Be exalted, O Lord, in your own strength. We will sing and praise your power. This is answered prayer in verses 1 through 7. There's nothing better, I think, when God answers our prayers, right? How many of us go, praise the Lord. <laughs> Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Man, to have our prayers answered is such a wonderful thing. Such a wonderful thing. It means he hears us. It means he's faithful to us. It means he delivers us when we need him. All of these things, of course, are according to his will. His, if in line with his purpose. Purpose for us and purpose for him. For us, it would be good for us, teaching us, growing us. For him, it would glorify him. Magnify him and give honor to him. I think, and I get ashamed of it now and then, but not always, but I'm when God does something, I'm like going, wow, that's amazing. I should not be surprised. Are you surprised when God does something amazing? We shouldn't be surprised, but we should be thankful and praise him for it. One of the things I thought of is like, hey, what about when we don't enjoy the blessings of answered prayer? Hmm. What does that mean? Well, I think it could mean three things. One is, we must not be praying any longer. We must have stopped praying. Second is, we're not praying according to his will. Or third, there's some disconnect on our relationship with him. That's if you don't enjoy the blessings of answered prayer. And then giving our lives, as he said, he gave life and life was given back. It's a really good decision to give our lives to Christ. And in verse 6, there's blessings and joy in following the Lord. The Lord is most blessed forever. The Lord said, you have made him exceedingly, says David, glad with your presence. And we are blessed to be saved, amen? amen. There's, a, there's, a, there's a blessing in being saved. Are we not blessed to know that we will be with Jesus forever, beginning in this earth? Are we not blessed to know that we're involved with him and he's involved with us? David is so confident in his trust in the Lord, he says that I will not be moved, which means in the, in the Hebrew, I will not be shaken. I will not be shaken. We can't be shaken in our walks with Jesus. We can't, we shouldn't be moved from Jesus in our walks. There's a lot of applications that I have here towards Jesus in verses 3 through 7. We do lack of time, I'm not going to be able to go over them. But do some research yourself and look at those particular blessings and those references, those definite parallels to our Lord. Verses 8 through 12, I read that. The Lord defends his own. I think if we read this list, it's like, whoa, Lord, that's pretty overwhelming. That's pretty amazing. But we know that God's going to deal with those people. We know that God's going to deal with them righteously, just and fairly. We know that. Speaks of his right hand, which is his strength, his ability, his wisdom, his protection, and his plans. And at the end of verse 13, or at the end of chapter 21, we see that God always wins. If you haven't figured that out yet, guys, God always wins. So it is, because he's God. This song began and ends with describing the power, strength, and salvation of God. That's how it began, that's how it ends. David is quick to give glory to God. David praises him for what he can do, 
and what his own strength is about me, the Lord, him alone. Exodus 14, 13 says this. You can read it on the screen. And Moses said to the people, do not be afraid, stand still, and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will accomplish for you today. It's all the Lord. You know, I thought that there are times when God will do what he does without us. You see, David is saying, it's all God's strength. I don't even really need to be in the mix, quite frankly. I don't even need to be a part of his equation. He has the power and the ability to do and the strength to do it all himself without us. That's what David is saying at the end of his, his song. Be exalted in your own strength, Lord, because I'm going to sing and praise your power. There's two things that I think of what God would do without us, when he would operate without us. One is we're not willing. We're not willing to come alongside his plan. We're not willing to come alongside his will to partner with him. We're unwilling, in other words. Or maybe it's not possible when God intervenes, when it's impossible for us to intervene, that God supernaturally will make something happen apart from you and me being involved in the equation. But maybe we'll notice or we'll be witness to that amazing thing. There's a book. I've got a copy of it showing up on the screen here. There it is. It's called Dreams and Visions. Jean's been reading this book. She might have told you guys some of it. Got it right here. Real quick, now, I'm just going to read you a few things from it. But I want you to know that in those eastern countries like Afghanistan, Iraq, Syria, those places where it's very impossible for Christians to go and evangelize. God is doing the work there. Because we can't. It's pretty amazing. Here's a little bit of it. When I, when I read this preface today, I was like, wow, Lord, it's great. On the surface, it looks like, man, all these Muslims are getting saved. Well, let me say this. That's just a bright product of God's power and God's ability. His power and ability is saving Muslims. That's what's happening. They're the byproduct of his power and ability and desire for salvation. Remember, that's his mission. His mission is salvation. To save that which is lost. Can we not agree that there are a lot of those Muslims that are lost? Because they do not know, they do not have the light of Christ. Here's a few things of the preface. The world appears to be getting more dangerous by the minute. Sometimes it seems as if the terrors sown in the master's field are taking over. Yet there's a God in heaven who still cares about us, still sits on the throne, and still has a plan. And thanks to his revolutionary plan for our world, the wheat is flourishing. The phenomenon is not limited to a few isolated locations. It's not simply visiting some lucky town in the Middle East. What we see, Jesus presenting himself to Muslims everywhere. Dozens of Islamic countries and countless Muslim cultures have been invaded by Jesus' love. If you are concerned about the end of the world or Islamic fundamentalism or whether or not America will survive an economic collapse, this book is for you. Well, I would agree. It's a great read. Whatever, would, uh, would condition, whatever conditions you worry about most, you can take heart that Jesus remains firmly in control. As always, Jesus touches people one by one. Jesus, uh, yet he reveals the most important movement of our time, the movement of God. Each of their stories, which is what this book is about, real-life stories of Muslims who have been converted to Christ. His, his story is really his story. Jesus wants you to know what he's doing and to appreciate the power by which he still works today. Amen? More Muslims are coming to faith in Jesus today more than ever before. In fact, I believe more Muslims have become followers of Jesus in the last 10 years than the last 14 centuries of Islam. I believe Islamic terrorism is Satan's attempt to keep the gospel message away from Muslims. The enemy thinks that if he can make the rest of us afraid of Muslims or make us hate them, they, they, then he can short-circuit Jesus' church from reaching Muslims. Is that not true? You see someone in a burqa, you see someone in some kind of, they're, 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 what they wear, what do you do? What's your reaction? 
you move over, you walk across the other side of the street, think about it. See, it's a ploy of Satan to make you fearful, to make me afraid, to not engage. But that isn't working. Jesus has stepped in and is opening Muslim hearts himself. That's the power of God. Okay, guys? That's the Lord working where we can't. Where it's impossible for us to do so. Here's a short story. I ask for your indulgence just for another five minutes. It's called The West Bank Story. Amina stared at the building as she created, as she, um, I'm sorry, I can read this right. As she crested on the hill of her walk into town, the sight of it had stopped her a hundred yards short of her destination. The young Muslim woman reached into the cloth bag slung over her right shoulder, pulled out of a bottle of water, sipped for the lukewarm contents, and gazed for several more minutes at the structure beside the road ahead. It was as unmistakable as her friend had said it would be. This was the building she had seen in her dream two nights ago. Amina had learned to respect her nighttime visitations and had been positive the moments she woke up that the building was real. Dreams that last several months had been the most remarkable experience of her 22 years. She now knew the man who appeared to her almost every night was the great prophet, Isa, or Jesus. But mostly there were things she did not know. Why would Isa pay attention to an unmarried woman in an, uh, in an unimportant West Bank village? Was there something he intended for her to do? What about his presence made her feel so deeply loved? Could anyone tell her what the dream meant? Three nights ago, she had finally talked to Jesus. She supposed it would be called praying, but to a prophet, and asked him every question on her mind. That night, the building appeared to her, not Jesus, just the structure itself, and she knew she must find it. As she resumed her walk, the front door of the building opened. A man stepped into the afternoon sun. Amina was close to only those people on the street. The man had noticed her immediately and realized she was walking in his direction. A discernible purpose in her steps. He watched her approach until she was close enough that he could speak to her without shouting. Can I help you with something? He said. Amina looked at him for an instant as if she didn't understand the question. I'm not sure. I don't know exactly why I'm here. She realized the man did not intimidate her. There was a warmth about him that encouraged her to continue with the bizarre truth about her presence in this town. She raised her right hand, mumbling toward uh, the door, mumbled toward the doorway that she had come. She said, I saw this building in a dream. I see. The man crossed his arms, raised his hand to his face, and patted his chin. You haven't had any other dreams recently, have you? Amina's eyes darted from the stranger's face to the building and back again to the man. Well, yes, I have. He looked at Amina, then his eyes brightened, and he dipped his head in greeting. My name is Jamal. I occasionally meet with people who are having dreams about Jesus. That's why I asked. I had a dream about him myself a few years ago. Jamal leaned close to Amina and whispered, the Jesus dreams changed everything in my life. Jamal invited the woman inside to talk. She replayed her questions for him and explained how long she had tried to find answers. Once she came across the Christian television station and talked about Jesus all the time, but watching it in her home was not possible. Her father had almost caught her one time, and she decided afterward that viewing such things on the family TV was not was just way too risky. She also asked a few friends uh, about those dreams, but none had had them. For nearly three hours, Jamal and Amina walked through all this, all she had wondered about Jesus. He concluded their time together by giving her the Bible he had used to answer many of her questions, and he offered her several Christian books, which she gratefully stuffed in a bag. At home, Amina hid her treasures, reading them only when she knew what others in the family would not discover her secret life. 
studying the New Testament one night, she realized that the source of Jesus' travels likely had taken him right through her village. The town, by then, had already been a long history since Canaanites had founded it long before the Israelites entered the land. The real life dreams of Jesus' time on earth uh, riv uh, riveted Amina, and several weeks after meeting Jabal, her own journey brought her to the take a step of faith in becoming a Jesus follower. Jamal had been clear about what being a disciple of Jesus would require of her, but it was tougher than she had, than she had anticipated. Naturally, the very is she chafed at having no one talk to about this growing relationship with her Savior. But months later, Amina led her sister to Christ, and the chain reaction started. Soon there were five believers in her ancient village. Amina started a house church through which she had a handful of Israelites uh, or believers plan an outreach event for Muslim women. The success of their advertising sat in their stunned them. They had hung posters promoting a celebration for Palestinian women at each mosque in nearly two nearby villages. And on the morning of the event, more than 200 veiled Muslims showed up. Through Jamal, Amina had found Hannah, an American believer, visiting the West Bank who would be the day's guest speaker. Hannah and Amina explained God's love for women and the special calling he has on their lives. Although cautious with their words, the sponsoring ladies' faces radiated the love of Jesus. Many of the audience wept as they unwrapped gifts brought from America. At the end of Hannah's last presentation, a hundred Muslims surrounded the two women. Amina was now the one answering questions. Alone after the last guest departed, Amina and Hannah stood, Hannah stood together in the doorway of the meeting hall. They relished several minutes of quiet in the, sense, uh, in the serene light of the late afternoon before Amina spoke. Hannah, do you remember the energetic woman at the, with the red hijab who talked to you after your last teaching? Yes, I sure do. She was so sweet. She even invited me to her house for dinner tonight. Amina nodded. I've had several conversations with her, and she's always full of questions. I think Jesus is doing something in her heart. Still nodding, she looked at Hannah. That surprises me, though. Amina's voice trailed off. Why, Amina? Why does her interest in Jesus surprise you? Because her husband is a top leader in Hamas. Hannah's jaw dropped. Amina swallowed and laughed and said, have a nice dinner tonight. <laughs> That's just one little story out of all of these stories that God is powerful and that God is doing the work where we cannot go. You're praying for that family member? Maybe you can't get to that person. God will meet you there. There's someone in your neighborhood you're unable to always connect with? God will meet you there. Whatever it is, God is powerful and God will do it. Amen? Let's pray. Lord, thank you again for your word and thank you for this time. Thank you for the testimony and the witness, Lord, of these precious people. We pray, God, now for the lost. We pray for the Muslims. We pray for uh, any any other country, Lord, that, that they're just not following you. They have no belief in you, like Japan or like in India, those faraway places in China. Lord, but we know that you're doing a work, a great work. Continue to use your people where they can be used. And Lord, where we cannot go, we pray that you would visit in dreams. We pray that your power, that your love, as they've all said unanimously, this Jesus, all we feel is love. Lord, that's your message. And so God, we pray that you can use us and that we would give glory when we see you move. But we can't, or even in spite of us. In Jesus' name.